Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chris Kennedy. I'm the Director of Development from the Vatican Observatory Foundation, and we're thrilled to have you here. Um, I'm joined by uh, Brother Guy Consomagno and Chris Graney coming to us from Indiana. Brother Guy is the Director of the Vatican Observatory, and, um, and Chris Graney is an adjunct scholar with the Vatican Observatory. And we're honored also to have Father Jim Martin, Editor-at-Large of American Magazine, who is joining us from New York City. So I am going to turn it over to Father Martin, and, uh, and 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 we will go from there. Thank you again very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, great to be with you all. Great to be with you, Guy and Chris. It's wonderful to be with uh, such a distinguished group, especially on this historic day. I am going to uh, serve as the lay uh, person here, even though I'm a priest and I'm ordained, uh, but I am certainly not anywhere near uh, the, the scholarly firepower that we have today. So I'm going to ask the questions that I think are in a lot of people's minds. Uh, the first question is, I'm going to throw it to both of you. I'm sure you've been asked this. Tell us what an eclipse is. An eclipse is uh, a lining up of shadows. So the sun gives off light. The earth always casts a shadow behind it. But most of the time, the shadow just goes into empty space and nobody notices it. And the moon casts a shadow. Most of the time, it goes to empty space and you never notice it. The moon's orbit is tilted about 15 degrees so that odds are whenever the moon is passing between the sun and the earth, its shadow will go either above or below the earth. And likewise, the earth's shadow will go below or below, below the moon. But twice a year, the moon will pass into the Earth's shadow, and that's a lunar eclipse. And twice a year, the Earth will pass into the moon's shadow, and that's the solar eclipse. But for us people on Earth, the difference is that if you're on the side of the Earth where the moon is when it's going through the shadow, anybody can see the moon in its shadow and see the lunar eclipse. But to see a solar eclipse, You've got to be in that very narrow part where the moon's shadow actually touches the Earth. And so even though there's a, a solar eclipse twice a year, most of the time it'll be over the Atlantic or over Antarctica or someplace, you know, not particularly where there's a lot of people. What's special today is it's over the center of the United States. Yeah, whereas, whereas with the lunar eclipse, half the planet can see the lunar eclipse. So... Everybody sees it or only you know, everybody in the United States, everybody, you know, in whatever side of the earth is facing the moon at that point. Whereas the solar eclipse, it's just this narrow band that goes from through Mexico, Texas, Indiana, out out into the Atlantic. And but is the band is was uh, 100 miles wide or something like that, that that those people get to see it. So I, I was just going to ask about the narrowness of the band. Um, what happens kind of outside? Uh, so I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm from, I'm uh, from New York City, or I'm, I'm broadcasting from New York City, and I know the big place everybody's going right now is Buffalo, at least where I, I am. Uh, do you see kind of a percentage-wise a decrease in darkness? Is that the idea right. as you get further away? Though if you're really far away, you might, and you could look at the sun through those special glasses so that you don't blind yourself. Incidentally, if you're looking at the sun and it hurts, stop looking. That's you know, the general rule. That's a good yeah. rule. Uh, but if you had the glasses and you could see the sun, the moon might just take a little finger fingernail section out of it. As you get closer to the center line, it passes maybe a little bigger piece of it. By the time you're at New York, you might get even 90% of it covered, but the rest of the sun is still so bright that it gets dark, but not a whole lot dark. And your eyes are very good at compensating for changing light, so you wouldn't really notice. So, so I suppose it's true that a lot more people see a solar eclipse than what we just than in that narrow band, but only along that narrow band is the sun completely blocked out for the dramatic effect. And once you get away from the band, it, it, it very quickly is such that you would never notice it unless you had special equipment looking up at the sun. There's a, a famous article written after a solar eclipse back in the 70s by Anne, Dill Anne Dillard. And she makes the comparison. The difference between a partial eclipse and a total eclipse is the difference between kissing somebody and marrying them. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, you, you, you and I, as two celibate men, probably <laughs> need, don't need to comment on that. Um, 
Yes, Chris. Well, the uh, the example I use is it's the difference between having all the numbers in the lottery ticket, that's the total eclipse, and having almost all the numbers in the lottery ticket, that's the partial eclipse. <laughs> that's right. The, the have... last number makes a big difference. <laughs> that's right. I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to a question I'm sure is on everybody's mind. When I was a little boy, uh, I remember some eclipse, we had a little box and we had the little pinhole and all that. It was very exciting. And what I remember was, and maybe this is what most people remember, is that you shouldn't look at the sun because the ultraviolet rays were, were still getting through. But uh, because it was dark, you weren't uh, sort of, uh, it, it wouldn't kind of prevent you from looking at it. Is that is that the reason we don't look at the sun or we don't look at we don't look at the eclipse? Not really. I mean, there there is truth to all of that. And there is a reason why just a dark piece of glass isn't something that you want to stare at the sun at. Mm -hmm. But uh, the real problem is, if there's any bit of the sun visible, it hurts your eyes. And I don't just mean it's damaging your eyes. That's true. It hurts. If it hurts, don't do it. That's why we don't look at the sun normally. Now, if you've got a, a filter that will make things dark, you can look for a minute or two or second, you know, 15 seconds long enough to see, oh, yeah, there's a piece there and then look away and you're not going to go blind for the rest of your life. If you were to stare at it for an hour and the filter was not perfect, yeah, eventually you might get rays hitting your eyes that could damage them. But again, if it hurts, stop doing it. But but here's the question. I the, Again, I'm speaking for all of the, the great, the, the, the massive people. If I look at the sun in in the daytime in the in the bright sun, I, yeah. I can't look at it because it just hurts my eyes too much. But would I theoretically be able to look at the eclipse for much longer and it would still it would still damage me, right? Um that's like, the theory, would, would but it, would it hurt would it hurt me to look at the eclipse, to stare at the eclipse? It hurts you to stare at the moment before or after totality. Okay. But totality itself, you can look at. Okay. And there's not ultraviolet rays or anything else. It's everything is being blocked by the moon. Okay. And that's a view that you should not miss if you're in totality. Yeah, yeah. you don't want to you, you don't want to be so worried about hurting your eyes that you miss the totality. In general, the eclipse is not more dangerous than looking at the sun on any normal day. The difference is, is that on any normal day, why would you want to look at the sun? You look up at the sun like, oh, that's bright, and you look away. Whereas on the eclipse day, people will be like, I'm going to look at this because I want to see something. And that's and then they would make themselves look at the sun. But yeah, you I don't see. want to be looking at the sun, but you also don't want to be so worried about this that you miss the totality of the eclipse. I see. OK, there you go. That you just answered my, my biggest question. Now, um, when when is the next solar eclipse on the continental United States? Do we know? I guess we know. Yeah, oh, we are able to predict these things, you know, to a very high precision. And uh, people were able to do that for thousands of years to varying degrees of precision. So the next one is going to be in August of 2043. Um, I actually looked up the date. I think I sent it to you in, the, in that list of cheat, but you can read it off to me, uh, the date uh, that oh, I Oh, here it is. Here it is. August 23rd, 2044. Right. And, and where exactly it's going to be, you can find it on the internet. That's why God gave us Google. <laughs> that's right which which the ancients knew all about too right um, well being able to predict eclipses was a big deal sure uh back in the days when you thought that the stars and the planets controlled everything you know if nowadays we really don't understand the dark sky very well because most people don't see a dark sky at night so we don't understand what stars and planets would look like to the ancients um just as an example of why we can't see dark skies. Remember that phrase that Snoopy used to use to start a novel? It was a dark and stormy right. night. Right. Well, when is the last time you were outside on a stormy night? They're not dark anymore. No. All that light from the cities hits the clouds and it turns them into the sickly gray color. But back when the skies were really dark and we didn't have lights, you paid attention to the stars mm. and you noticed seven things moving in the sky back and forth through a series of constellations, star pictures. And people tried to draw a correlation between what star was where, what moving star or planet was there, and did that have any correlation to things happening on Earth? Well, of course, what the stars and planets are, 
are great timekeepers. So if you kept seeing the same stars at wintertime and you kept coming down with the flu at wintertime, you might say, maybe we are under the influence of those stars. Mm. Hence the word influenza, which just mm. means influence. And if that was the case, then we could you know, predict the stock market or who's going to win the next election by calculating stars and planets. Frankly, I think astrology probably does as good a job as most of our pundits do, but that's a you know, topic for another. <laughs> and so to be able to know when the moon was going to get blocked out or when the sun was going to get blocked out was important to these people who were trying to predict the future. So they put a lot of effort into it, even if they didn't know what it meant. And you can imagine... Um, you know, it's, it's a huge deal that's going on. There's all sorts of people, you know, converging for the for the eclipse. The total eclipse is a big deal for us. And you can imagine if you were a society that did not have the ability to predict a total eclipse and one happened, you know, the sky got dark in the middle of the day, people would be pretty uh, concerned. You know, they might, they, the reaction wouldn't necessarily be so good. And there's a Jesuit connection to this. Of course. So <clears throat> So around 1600, 1610, a bunch of Jesuits went from Europe to China. They got into China, and among the things that they did was to introduce to the Chinese modern astronomy. Ironically, some of the modern astronomy was the very astronomy Galileo was getting in trouble for back in Rome, but never mind that. So around 1610, there was a solar eclipse. It was a... a uh, an annular eclipse, I looked it up, December 1610, the Chinese astronomers screwed up predicting when it was going to happen. But Sabatino di Ursus was an Italian Jesuit who had arrived in China with uh, Matteo Ricci. He predicted the, the eclipse, and he predicted it correctly. Then there was another eclipse uh, another in 1629, probably a lunar eclipse this time. And again, the Jesuits got it right. At that point, the Chinese handed over to the Jesuits the command to reform the Chinese calendar so they could get the eclipses right. And this continued on for the next you know, 30 to 50 years. All sorts of Jesuits who had been trained at the Jesuit College under you know, Christopher Clavius and were there at the time that Galileo showed off his telescope, they brought all of this to China to the point where one of these guys, Johann Adam Schalbanbel, was, it said, uh, he was so important to the Chinese government that he helped choose, you know, who the crown prince was going to be, who the next emperor was going to be. In the whole history of China, there was probably no Westerner who had the kind of influence he had. So, 1660 comes along. The Jesuits have been doing this for 50 years. Ferdinand Verbiest comes. He uh, works for von Schall and eventually is the guy who takes over as, you know, running the calendars. Then there's a new emperor. The new emperor doesn't like these Jesuits. So he has them all arrested. 1665, the Jesuits predict the eclipse better than the Chinese can. This makes the Chinese really mad, and Shal is sentenced to death. Oh my gosh, I didn't know this story. <laughs> so, the day... Following his sentencing, there is an earthquake in China. The Chinese say, all right, all right, we're sorry, we didn't mean to do this, and he's let free. Uh, fortunately, he uh, you know, died the next year, but Verbeek took over as the director of the Imperial Observatory, and the Jesuits kept running the Imperial Observatory of China until 1805. Oh my gosh, that's a great story. Well, let, you know, let me ask you guys, uh, this is a little off topic, but not really. I'm sure there are a lot of people here who are uh, people of faith and students and teachers and whatnot. What do you say to people um, who say this is a sign from God and this is a well, this is a judgment? Uh, what, what do you what do you what's your normal response to that kind of stuff? First, I have to bite my tongue because Lord knows we all need judgments, and you know usually it's the judgment of that guy over there. Right. Um, but there's you know never a time when we couldn't improve and clean up our act a little more. So that doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. uh, until we, we were actually, Chris and I are here for a retreat. And uh, there was a gathering of a lot of religious people at a retreat house nearby. And we heard some wonderful 
variants on that, but I'll start with my first, which is the eclipse is so predictable that we're in a universe that's logical, a universe that can be predicted. That's not something to take for granted. Well, yeah, the ancient Greeks and Romans thought they, the gods ran everything. And, you know, if the god decided the, the, you know, the moon's going to go away or the sun's going to go away, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. That's not the universe we're in. That's not the kind of universe we're, we believe in. It's not the kind of creator or god that we believe in. So we're in a universe that has been made predictable. But what cannot be predicted is how beautiful it's going to be. Oh, it's beautiful. And how, you know, we're going to react to it because every eclipse is different. And so it's this combination of both being beautiful and being predictable mm. that I think, you know, tells you something about the whoever was responsible for putting this whole system together. Yeah, I can't I can't add to that. That's a good one. But <laughs> well, let me let me let me shift. But but but, but but sure, but there's a but. We heard we heard a new one. No. About uh Traditionally, the sun has been represented as you know, brilliant, and, and that's you know, we would oh, yeah. think of being God. And traditionally, people have associated, I have no idea why, Mary with being the moon. Right. There are many depictions of you know, a crescent moon and, and, and the Virgin Mary standing on it. That's a kind of a traditional thing. Somebody said, what is the image of the moon, Mary, being surrounded by the glow of the, the solar corona? especially because today happens to be the Feast of the Annunciation. Right. Nice coincidence. Good. That nice is very nice. Also, she, I've heard she reflects Christ's glory. That's, that's like, like the moon. Um, yeah. Let's, let's shift a little bit um, in terms of what people can look for and what will happen in the path of totality and um, you know, before, after totality, or even if you're not in totality, um, tell us what a person in totality we'll see and how's that going to be different from a person who's not in totality so a person who's not in totality if if they uh, are only 80 or 90 percent they uh coverage may see some dimming of the sky um but they won't see a lot they may see some shapes in the shadows on the ground the 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 the, the eclipsed sun shape because each little leaves the gaps between leaves form a little pinholes Things like that. So, so it, you look at the sidewalk look, and you see a zillion little crescents. Crescents, yeah. Um, and this, in that, let's, let's let's pause just a second. Let's pause. Why why does that happen? What's going on? Well, you've got different leaves overlapping right. each other in a tree, so that there's right. only a tiny spot that the light gets through all of the leaves, mm -hmm. and it acts like the lens of a pinhole camera. Okay. Yeah. So it projects the, the image of the sun down onto the ground. The pinhole it will make is is you can be used to project images of all sorts of different things, and in this case, it will project the sun. Um, as you get closer, if you're not in the path, if you're in more, it's like ninety nine percent or stuff. Then you might actually see some noticeable darkening of the sky and things like that. Still, the sun, even one percent of the sun's disk is. is quite bright and that will be enough to light up the the ground very well so it will not go dark if you're in the path of totality well but yes. but even before we go to the totality yeah. you might feel it getting cooler that's right oh yeah and so part of the bit of the sun is it's being blocked off like a, a cloud coming in and suddenly the temperature drops okay. and you will probably notice that if it gets dark enough that uh, the animals notice something's going on then uh, you might it might be suddenly quieter because the animals are going to be sleep. There, there was a story of a of an expedition where uh, it was a miserable place in Western Australia, a lot of flies, and as soon as it got dark, the flies settled down. Yeah, and then in the path of totality, you block out that la the last bit of the sun's light will be extinguished by the moon, and then it actually gets dark, dark enough that you might be able to see bright, uh, bright stars, the planets. Um, the sky, depending, so we were both at the 2017 eclipse, it was only two minutes long. 
And that path of, of shadow is not was not super wide, maybe 40 miles, which means that often the distance you're looking into an area that's not in the shadow. So you could see out in the distance, you could see it, it was like a sunset sky all the way around us because there was brightness in the distance, darkness where we were. That and was not, very remarkable. And not only that, but because we were out in the plains in Kentucky, you could see basically the spot of light rushing towards you as the moment of totality was about to begin. That was pretty awesome. You know, you just like see it in the sky coming, the darkness coming on. And so uh, interesting. You mean you could see kind of on the ground, the shadows or? Well, it was just darker. Yeah. It wasn't a sharp shadow, but it was darker. Yeah. Wow. One of the things I've heard today, and I'm not sure I've ever noticed this, usually when you're outside and you see your shadow, you know, it's kind of fuzzy because the sun is an extended disc and different angles from different... The last gasp of light, what some people will call the diamond ring effect. So the sun is almost covering it up, but now the sunlight is coming from just a tiny point and the shadows become much sharper. Oh, so, so you know, take a look at your shadow if you think of it. There are so many things. Don't worry if you don't see them all. Yeah. But these are just some of the things you can. You know. And don't be fiddling with your phone. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't you be staring to... at your phone. <laughs> right. Because it's only going to be a few minutes and you don't want to have missed it trying to get right. the perfect picture. Yeah. You're, you're not going to call your friend. Hey, I'm in it because everybody's <laughs> That's doing right. that. It's crazy. Now, here's another big. Oh, oh did you... go ahead, guy. Oh, go there, ahead. There, there's there's more. But yeah, wait, there's more. One of the things that I've never noticed, but people talk about, is uh, your sense of color changes. For reasons that I don't quite understand, it's strongest in red and green, where I believe red stands out and green fades and turns gray. Maybe I've got that backwards. I'm not sure. I haven't noticed this myself. I, I read about it. Yeah. Maybe it's true. It'll be um, worth checking now is out. This, is this in uh, sort of uh, not totality is that no, no this is we're all all this that we're talking about is totality totality yeah. okay I yeah see. but but who knows maybe you'll see effects like this who knows do you see then, the uh crescents and whatnot if you're not in totality or yeah you yes. see the crescents wherever you are if, if there's okay. a you know any if you're anywhere near the eclipse and you see the crescents leading up to totality and after totality now so here, people, go ahead, people the path of totality get Everything that people who are in the partial path, the non-path of totality, they get everything that those people get plus their totality. Okay. And of course, then and in totality is where you can see the sun's the corona, the sun's atmosphere. And uh, if you have and you if you have a pair of binoculars, you should use them to take take a look at the sun. Uh, again, but if you don't, don't worry about it. When when the when it's in totality, not as Brother Guy says, if it's not comfortable to look at the sun. Don't look at the sun. <laughs> now, uh, how long was, how long does the sort of pitch black last? Well, it depends from eclipse to eclipse. Okay. And one of the things that makes this eclipse different from the one in 2017 is that it lasts a little longer. The moon is covering up more of it. So most people will say, see what, three to four minutes. Mm -hmm. Wow. This time. So it, it's in that feels like an eternity. Yeah. The that's other that's thing that's different is that the sun goes through these 11 year cycles where there are a lot of sunspots and a whole lot of stuff coming off the sun and then it quiets down. Then there's a whole lot of stuff. And the 2017 was a relatively quiet sun. And right now is a relatively active sun. So that Corona, that halo of light, which is always there, but you can never see because the sun is so much brighter. That halo of light around the moon during the eclipse should be pretty spectacular this time. One of the things we look for. No, Not that it wasn't that. spectacular enough in 2017, but yeah. it might be more spectacular now. Now, asking asking another lay question, what does that have to do with the sunspots? Because aren't the sunspots all kind of covered by the by the moon? Well, yes. <clears throat> but what is a sunspot? A spot on the sun that's just a little bit cooler than the rest. So instead of being 5,000 degrees, it's only 4,000 degrees. It's the place where the magnetic field erupts from the inside of the sun and charged particles can run around the mag magnetic field lines and be ejected out into space. And these particles then blow off the sun into something called the solar wind. And the solar wind is what hits the Earth's atmosphere and causes the auroras. So if you see the aurora borealis, that's that. When there's a lot of it, it will give you uh, interference in your radio 
It can, you know, a big solar storm can even interfere with power transmission. There was a ginormous storm around in the 1850s, the Carrington event, mm -hmm. which if it happened today would really knock off power and create a lot of problems on Earth because since 1850, we suddenly use an awful lot of electric power and electric wires. So keeping an eye on these sorts of storms is important. But the sunspots create the stuff coming off the sun and the stuff coming off the sun makes the corona. And there is another Jesuit connection. In 1860, there was a young Jesuit priest who had been named the director of the observatory of the Roman College in Rome. And he was interested in astronomy and interested in all the latest technology, including this thing called photography, which wasn't very old by then. There was a solar eclipse in Spain, and he mounted an expedition to observe the eclipse, to look at it with his telescopes, and to photograph it. So what? It's a nice pretty picture. Well, the first pretty pictures of the eclipse. That's cool. But here's the thing. If you're looking at the eclipse and, and the sun's being blotted out and now you're seeing this shimmering light around the moon, you could very reasonably ask yourself, what the heck am I looking at? Mm -hmm. Is that actually something connected to the sun? Or is that just light in the atmosphere over my head, you know, like a rainbow or like something else that just because of sunlight being scattered around? And there was no easy way to answer that. Secchi took a photograph. An Englishman, um, <clears throat> Dela, Dela, Cor, Dela, Dela, Dela something or another, he's got he had an Italian name, but he was an Englishman, <clears throat> took a photograph at the same time. They compared the photographs from 100 miles apart, and the corona looked exactly the same. Hmm. So that said, no, we're looking at something at the sun. Hmm. Well, after this, Secchi got really interested in uh, the sun and solar activity. He also was interested in magnetic fields, you know, mapping out the, where the Earth's magnetic field was. And he noticed whenever the sun was active, there were deflections in the Earth's magnetic field. He was one of the first people to make that connection between stuff going on in the sun and stuff happening to our magnetic field here on Earth. Well, just as I mentioned, this is important to us nowadays. You want to know if the sun is spewing out a lot of stuff so we can be prepared for it. So NASA has a couple of spacecraft. Two of them, they're called the stereo spacecraft. They're orbiting the sun, two different angles, keeping an eye on what's going on in the sun. And there is an instrument package that specifically measures the coronal activity. And of course, it being NASA, it has a name. The Sun-Earth Connection Coronal in Heliospheric Investigation Package, which if you spell out the letters, S-E-C-C-H-I, Secchi. Oh, perfect. I'm waiting for the day when NASA can come up with an acronym that spells out Consulmano. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> to, to add to that, I mean, that builds on uh, the much earlier study of the sun that was done by another Jesuit, Father Christoph Shiner. How nice that somebody named Shiner was looking at things that shine. Right. And, and he but he uh, is really sort of the first person to conduct an in-depth, long-term research you know, study of a celestial object, as opposed to like with a, with a telescope, with as opposed to making discoveries and you know, seeing this. He studied the sun for years and years. And he how, how do you how, how do you study the sun in the 1620 with a telescope? But you hurt your eye. No, you don't. You project it on a screen, which is what he shows. He had he shows a telescope set up projecting on the screen with a guy in a nice little Jesuit hat back in the back. Another person doing work, probably like the graduate student, you know, the assistant doing work and tra tracing out where the sun spots tracing were. Out where the sun spots okay. were, shade, getting the shading right. The difference. He, he their their observations show great detail in the sun spots. He figured out how they move and and you know how they behave, how they increase and decrease. His book um, also contains an image of, well, gee, you have this problem that the sun moves across the sky. We want to, we need to track this, like pointing the telescope, you know, moving over, up, over, up is a pain. So they invented something that the astronomy uh, nerds in our audience would recognize as the first illustration of what we call an equatorial mount for a telescope. And uh, so this is a massive study of the sun, which was, you know, sort of, the thing that started solar astronomy. 
Yeah. So well, another connector. Was he connection. was he the first guy to discover sunspots? No, the first guy to discover sunspots was sunspots. Galileo, right? No, <laughs> no. But the funny thing is, is, those two argued with each other over who was the first one because guy Shiner thought that well, I did. Galileo's like, no, I did, it. and and they bickered to the detriment of uh, of astronomy. There's a long story there, but actually, a guy named Thomas Harriot um, beat it both to it. But they also argued as to what the spots actually were. You know, and in the Aristotelian view. The sun should not be flem blemished, but there are the spots. And Galileo said, well, there are spots on the sun. And Shiner, the first time he saw these, had, well, not necessarily. What if what we're looking at are little planets that we never noticed before passing between us and the sun, transiting you know, the way that we actually find exoplanets, the way that you know, we saw the transit of Venus uh, 10, 12 years ago? How can you tell whether a spot is crossing in front of the sun, between the sun and us, or if it's actually attached to the sun and the sun is turning? How can you tell? Galileo knew the answer to this. Very clever. If you've got the ball of the sun and something's crossing across the equator, it will take longer because the equator is bigger than if it's crossing across the North Pole because the distance is shorter. On the other hand, if they're tied to the sun, they will take the same amount of time to go from one side to the other. So Galileo says, I have carefully observed sunspots, and I have found that they take exactly the same amount of time, whether they're at the equator or towards the poles. Therefore, they are attached to the sun. And he's right. We now know they are attached to the sun. And they take mostly the same amount of time to go around. But they don't take exactly the same. In fact, the star, the, the spots at the upper part of the sun take more time to move across because the sun isn't a big solid ball. It's a ball of gas. And the upper latitudes spin at a different rate from the equator. And Galileo should have been able to see this. And Shiner did. Shiner eventually did. Yeah. But, but Galileo, being Galileo and wanting to always be right, um, shaded his data, shall we say? No, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah, he 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 didn't. Portray, I wouldn't say he 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 didn't portray Shiner in the best of light in his writings. Yeah. So well, uh, thank you. We don't want to e eclipse, haha, -ha, uh, some of the concerns that people have uh, today. One of the things um, I'd like to ask, and I know it's on a lot of people's minds, uh, there's so many glasses and and devices and stuff. How can you really tell if your glasses are safe today? The simplest is if. First of all, if you know where you got them from and it's a reliable source, that helps. But um, before the eclipse, put them on. If you can see anything, they're not dark enough. If everything is good and dark, then go out and just for a second, look up at the sun. And if it hurts, don't do it. But if it is a, you know, if you can see the sun as a small round white dot, but it doesn't hurt your eye, then the odds are those are probably good enough. Nonetheless, you don't want to be staring at the sun for half an hour. There's no point to it. You look up, you say, okay, I can see the part where the moon is. And, you know, five minutes later, you go look again. But you just look for a minute. You, you Regardless of how good your glasses are, you don't want to be staring at the sun. And then right. the best glasses usually have sort of a silvery front to them and they'll have an ISO code on it, you know, certifying. But I mean, you always, you of course, somebody, you could always argue, well, you know, they can, you don't, they can fake that, too. fake that code. Yeah. So we're, we're talking here about like, what can you sort of yourself do? Mm -hmm. And uh, these, what guys said, you know, if, and always, if it, if it doesn't seem comfortable, don't do it. And in general, there's no reason you have to sit there and just stare at the eclipsing sun continuously anyway and that will always even if you somehow got sold a bad pair of glasses not staring and staring and staring is good you'll be happy to just look up and get a glimpse and go back there were all sorts of things we used to do as kids you know when you uh, i lived in a neighborhood with a lot of blue collar workers and they had welders glasses and you will find those who say oh no they're not perfect against the ultraviolet of the and which is true but you're not going to be looking that long Another thing we used to do back in the days of uh, photographic film 
is you take a stack of negatives until it was really dark. And again, you're not going to stare at the sun through that, but who has negatives nowadays? Well, that's helpful. I feel like we've saved a lot of people from uh, trips to the optometrist. Um, are there modifications you can make to like binoculars or telescopes or even cell phone cameras to, to see the eclipse? Is, is that reasonable? Um, at this point, no. <laughs> if you, you know, had were prepared and you could get places that would sell you the material that's in those glasses, you know, for a cell phone camera, you just put one of the glass lenses you know, with pieces over the camera and that should work just fine. Those are generally too small to fit over binoculars. Yeah. You know, but per, uh, 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 put your eclipse glasses over the lenses of your telus of your cell phone camera. And that should work pretty well for taking photos. But again, you don't, you know, have it staring at it because eventually you could burn out the camera in your cell phone too. Less expensive than replacing your eyes, but still kind of a pain to do. That's um let's talk a little bit about what to look for during an eclipse uh, if it's clear. Uh I've read about what are shadow bands. What you might see, especially if you've got a large expanse that's flat and rather bright, you know, a, a sheet out in the lawn or even a, a piece of concrete, is that you will see on that sheet lines of light and dark that sort of move back and forth. The best analogy is if you've ever been in a swimming pool on a sunny day, and you see the lines, uh, uh, lines of light, lines of sunlight on the bottom of the pool moving back and forth. And the idea, we're still not sure about this, but the idea is that our Earth's atmosphere acts like the water in the swimming pool and it moves, it bends the, the, the light of the sun back and forth. With the eclipse, it's dark enough that you might be able to see these kinds of bands, you know, off in a distance. Whether And this is when the sun, this only is a visible either near totality or the areas that are not going to experience the totality but are not very far off from totality because the idea is, is that the sun, the illuminating part of the sun is reduced to a very small bit and therefore it is that that point of light is more easily distorted. But the light from that is more, the distortion effects from the atmosphere are more visible when the light source is little. Yeah, the trouble is if you've got this, you know, white wavy atmosphere, and part of that light is blinked off, well, the point of light right next to that point of light might be blinked on, and so you wouldn't see anything. It's only when you're reduced down to one point. That's the same principle as why stars twinkle and planets don't, because a star is a point of light, and therefore it can go blink on and off in your eye as the Earth's atmosphere moves the, the beam of light back and forth. But a planet will shine from one side, then the other, then the one side, then the other. So you're more likely to have a continuous shine. And that means you can tell a star from a planet, which, you know, if you're in totality and it's nice and dark, there are a few planets that you can keep an eye out for. Uh, Jupiter should be up. Venus. Those might are the be, two easiest. Might be able to see Orion. The, the, it, and, and therefore, you can compare what stars look like compared to what a planet would look like. Yeah, and the, so so those Orion is. I'm going to be looking to see if I can see Orion during the eclipse. The planets, the last eclipse, I was able to see a couple of planets, but not many stars. And yeah. I'm definitely going to be looking to see can, is Orion there. There aren't a whole lot of stars actually close to the sun right now. The bright stars that you would be likely to see. Uh, the 2017 one, Regulus, was kind of close, and so yes. photographs show that. Though I don't remember actually seeing it with my eye. I think I did see, I think I saw Regulus, okay. but this is the sun's in Pisces, which is low on stars. Right. It's low on be, bright stars. You guys were together during the 2017 eclipse. Is that right? Oh my gosh. That was a story. Yeah. Let's hear it. Well, <clears throat> I got invited to uh, go to the parish, uh, St. Peter and Paul Parish in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, which is, you know, to my mind from, from Michigan, the middle of nowhere. But uh, I said, sure. And they put us up, put me up in a little widow lady uh, tobacco farmer's house. And at that point, I guess Chris and I had maybe probably only known each other a couple of years at that point. Yeah, yeah. But Chris was from Louisville. I said, why don't you come out and see if you know, she's got another room? So Chris and his wife came out. So the three of us were staying in this place. And this lady was a hoot. She was just, she was <clears throat> happy Catholic. There are a lot of Catholics in, in Kentucky. 
I, who, who knew? I didn't know that. But it turns out that, you know, that was one of the first dioceses after you know, Boston and Chicago and Baltimore. Yeah. What? Bardstown. Bardstown. Diocese Bardstown. And it was a beautiful place, a beautiful spot for observing it right near the center of totality. Right. Well, this this widow lady, farmer, was also, she claimed, the only Democrat in the county. And uh, had you know great things to say about all of her neighbors, which I won't repeat. So about two hours before the eclipse, the phone rings, and it turns out that the governor of Kentucky was going to be in the area because this was you know the height of Eclipse City to you know shake hands and and the glad hand, and he wanted to meet the Pope's astronomer. And I should add that the farm we were on was out was out a gravel road, so we are middle of nowhere. We are not easily accessed. Yeah. You know. So you you saw the actual the, the the cars show up. Well, we we had gone out to take a little walk, to get a little leg stretch in the process, and uh, as we come back, that's a you and your wife, me and my wife, and as we come back, here comes a state trooper, and then here comes this. You know, your typical big black shiny SUV. I was like, I wonder what that was. You know, we come up, we, we walk up to the house and we found out that yeah, it was the governor. The governor well, had come to see Guy. Now the down governor, the gravel roads and everything. Yeah. Now the governor was very much a Republican. And our our host was, you know, very much a Democrat. The governor charmed the pants off. She was just, you know, he was smooth. He was, you know, talking about the antiques in her home. He just charmed her marvelously. I'm thinking, oh, this guy's not so bad. So he said, well, so you know, where are you going to see the eclipse? And he says, well, I'm not actually sticking around for the eclipse. Go, what? You came all this way. You're in the best place in the country to see the eclipse. It's in your state. And he says, well, the Secretary of the Treasury decided he wanted to visit Fort Knox today. So I have to go off to Fort Knox to host him. We're going to be in the middle of Fort Knox during the eclipse. <laughs> Other funny thing that happened is, is that, if I remember this correctly, is he wanted to take a look through a telescope. And I had a telescope there. And Guy hadn't brought his. I was using the telescope. And not every telescope is the same. And finding the sun with a strange telescope is difficult. So Guy tries yeah, to you know, a filter on the telescope. Yeah, so, so the, you know, and, and so Guy is like, can I see this? I, I'll try, but couldn't find it. You know, so. You can never find things with somebody else's telescope. Yeah, that's especially the sun. That's tough to find because right. the filter blocks everything out. So you really have to go by the, you, you use the shadow of the telescope to make sure you're pointed in more or less the right direction. And then you hope you get lucky. This happened to Galileo. Galileo had just invented the telescope up. He was living up in uh, in Padua, in, in outside of Venice, and he's trying to get a job back home in Florence. So he comes down with the telescope. He talks to the you know the, the, the Duke of Florence, who was a teenager, he whom he had tutored in math like two years earlier. And on the way back, he stops in Bologna, and he's got this telescope. And he sets it up to show the, the city fathers of Bologna. And it's a long telescope. And anybody who's ever tried to use a telescope to show to, you know, things to other people, the nightmare when you can't point it in the right direction. And no matter how you try to point it, you can't see it. And it's just a little off. And you know it's there, but you can't. And everybody's standing around saying, yeah, right. Except none of them had ever even seen a telescope before. And here is this crazy guy saying, I can see craters and mountains on the moon. You're going, yeah, show me. <laughs> and you can't even see the moon. There was a fellow who wrote a scathing article about Galileo and what a total fake he was, because nobody could see what he was talking about in that telescope. It was just one of those nightmare days for Galileo. Even today, it can be very difficult. If people, if, if anyone who's watching gets an opportunity to look through a telescope at the sun, fill a properly filtered telescope. They may find it's it's not so, sometimes it, some people have a very difficult time looking through the eyepiece of a telescope and seeing anything. So it's, and, it's not, this problem has not completely gone away, even with modern scopes. As you pointed out, we've got uh, in the Vatican Observatory in Castel Gandolfo, we've got a beautiful exhibit we put together, the Vatican Museums will you know let you in to see our history in, in our visitor center. And in one place, there's a photograph of Pope Pius XII looking through a telescope. And nearby, another photograph of Pope Paul VI looking through a telescope. Well, it turns out 
When Pius XII was a little kid, he lived near the Vatican, and he belonged to an astronomy club run by astronomers at the Vatican Observatory. So since he was a little kid, he'd look through telescopes. So you see him looking through the telescope, and he's got this big smile on his hey, face. He looks happy. You can tell he knows what he's doing. But then you look at the picture of Pope Paul. <laughs> you look at the, he can't see anything. And there's I've seen fit film of it because it, it, the, the, it was shot when uh, at the Apollo landing. And you can see him coming down the... Uh, the the steps and you can just see he's saying i didn't see anything you know <laughs> i don't know what this was all about no, but... i didn't see i don't know what that was going well be. you know your your story about the governor of kentucky reminded me that if you had played your cards right and uh predicted the next eclipse in kentucky you could have been treated like the the, <laughs> the jesuits in china and you know maybe like chosen the next uh governor of kentucky or been on well yeah or 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 you know be sentenced to death depending yeah, on whether well, or right. not we made the uh, local you know. astronomers upset <laughs> You know, we were talking about we were talking about what to look for uh, during the eclipse if it's clear. What happens? Um, I two uh, two questions I think are interesting. Uh, what happens when you look at the horizon? Does anything change that way? Well, you'd mentioned before that it, it's like sunset only in every direction. So uh -huh. you have a ring of sunset because you're uh -huh. under a shadow. Uh -huh. And but but the areas you know a hundred miles or fifty miles away mm -hmm. are not. And not under as much of a shadow, so it'll still be you. You, you can see the, that it's lit out there, so that you get like a a, a, a golden glow around the horizon. And, wow. and different people have described different colors that they've seen. So yeah, yeah. that's one of those just things. I I don't know what you'll see, but every eclipse is different. So that's part well, of it. You, you talked about uh, you know obviously seeing different uh, planets and stars because the sky is darker. Are, are there particular constellations that people should look for in the United States? Well, Orion is the brightest of the constellations. It's okay. got the most bright stars. And it should be in the sky and visible. Mm -hmm. um, in the evening, it's setting, which is to say that it's going to be to the east of the sun. So it's basically rising and or, or about halfway up at the time of the eclipse. And it's got enough bright stars there that there's a good chance you'll be able to see one or two of them. How about Zodiac? Any people interested in the Zodiac? Any Zodiac signs up there? Sure, because the Zodiac consists of those constellations that the sun passes through in the course of a year. And since the all the objects in the solar system lie in the same plane, basically, that means all the solar system objects pass through the signs of the Zodiac. That's why we have the Zodiac. And the sun, and the sun is going to be smack dab in the middle of Pisces. But I thought people born at this time of year were not born under Pisces, but Aries. That's right. If you're born on April the 8th, then you would be an Aries. But that's because if you were born on April the 8th, then, oh, say the year 200, you would have been an Aries. <laughs> but, for, but, but astrology has not kept up with the procession, uh, something called the precession of the Earth's axis. And so they're all off by about half a sign. So you're about 50-50 chance that you're in the sign that you're supposed to be in. And the sun is in Pisces, right smack in the, in the middle of Pisces. Which, so, is, which is basically a bunch of really faint stars, so you're not going to see much. Yeah. How about uh, how about comets? Any comets or anything like that that we could see? There is a barely naked eye comet, Comet Ponce. Mm. Um, I don't think you'll be able to see it with the naked eye, but it's conceivable if you know exactly where to look and have a telescope that you could see it during the daytime with a telescope. I think people will be trying to do that. Um, not me. Now, here's another question. A guy, I think this is your specialty. Isn't your specialty meteorites? Is that your right. specialty? Now, will we be able to see uh, shooting stars more more frequently or uh, at all during an eclipse? Is it better or worse than just the regular nighttime sky? Um, that's not as foolish a question as you might think. <laughs> it's, the reason that we sh see shooting stars is that there's a cloud of dust actually in an orbit around the sun from left over from a comet that spewed off this dust. And the Earth in its orbit plows into the dust, just like a car hitting snowflakes. And so the front of the car you know, is covered with snowflakes and very few hit the back. That means that the time you see the shooting stars is from midnight to dawn to noon. That's the side of the earth that's plowing into the, the dust. Unfortunately, this eclipse is in the afternoon. So it's like looking out the back window instead of the front window of the moving car. 
So you're probably not going to see very many shooting stars. But it's it's not impossible. You a person could see, you know, as a bright one came through, you possibly could see, see a shooting star during the yeah. eclipse. But the odds aren't so good. Yeah. Well, listen, we're we're wrapping up a little bit, but I want to give you guys time to speak a little more personally about this and and your your work and and your background and your how, how you bring it to bear to this. What what still you, you know you studied these things and you've seen these things. What what still makes it exciting for you, guy? You talked a little bit about the. Is it the order of the universe that makes it exciting? Is it the beauty? What what is it that makes eclipses uh, put a smile on your face? Um, it was certainly all of that. But I'll put it a different way. I grew up in Michigan and, you know, I spent my summers in the shore of Lake Huron and Lake Huron is marvelous and it's marvelous to look at. And it's got this wonderful roar and there's a coolness, coldness that comes off it, even in the hottest of summer days. But looking at it and jumping in it are two different things. Mm -hmm. When I look at the stars, I have all of these marvelous emotions but during an eclipse, it's like jumping into the universe. The, the way that the eclipse makes the air colder and darker and the sounds changing, that makes this an immersive experience. I've, I've only really had it once. Um, we talked about you know what to see in a, in a clear day. The first time I went eclipse shopping, I went to Munich during an eclipse and it was clear up to the eclipse, but then it got so chilly when the sun was covered, that a cloud formed over where I was, and it started raining. So I didn't see any of the eclipse. I just oh. saw the rainfall. And then after the eclipse, the cloud went away. So it's possible, you know, even if you're in a cloudy area, you won't be able to see the beautiful lights. But you will experience the darkness. You will experience the quietness of the animals and, you know, the, the trucks pulling off the side of the road, hoping they can see something. And you can experience all of the other immersive moments of being in an eclipse. So it's not as good as being able to see it, but you do get the the experience in a way that is still unforgettable. So like jumping into the lake. Now, exactly. uh, before we get to Chris, guys, let me just, that's, that was a very interesting thing you just said. Can the weather and the coolness change so much that it could uh, rain or, or start clouds? Is, yep. is that what happened? Yep happens all the time wow and you know if it's kind of dodgy and it's humid out and you think what well, well, i think we're going to see it i think we're going to see it it could happen it could happen where we are obviously it, the weather has to be in an unstable state for that to right. happen right it's not going to happen all the time right. but but weather often is yeah. unstable <laughs> and uh chris what about you what what makes it so exciting for you i I, I, I'm not as good at articulating this as Guy. Um, I, I can only say I know it does. It, it was funny. I was, uh, we are at a uh, retreat, a, a faith and science retreat organized uh, by uh, a priest in Illinois named Father Timothy Salpe. And a number of us from the Vatican Observatory here, also a uh, um, Dr. Jeffrey Cook, Cookie, who is uh, an astronomer, who's in fact going to use the Keck telescope later on this week. For a, and uh, we're all here, and somebody and I was showing um, somebody uh, the sun through a solar hydrogen alpha telescope with prominences were up on it. And one of the fr Franciscan friars who was here said, "Hey, Chris, have you ever done this before?" And <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, a lot." He and, it, and he was joking because I was gushing on so much about it that it was like I had never seen a prominence before on the sun. But of course, I've seen them all the time. So I, I'm not so good as, as Guy is articulating it, but I do. It never gets old. It just never gets old. It's always cool. And and uh, um, yeah. that's all I can say about it. Well, that's that great. Proclaim. Now, I know uh, people who have been watching are probably interested in the work of the Vatican Observatory. Can you tell a little bit to tell us a little bit more about how people can get involved? Sure. We've got uh, we've had a dozen astronomers from around the world who are doing a dozen different astronomical projects. Our, the old joke is our goal was to be small but good, and we're halfway there. Actually, I think we're pretty good, the astronomy that happens there. But uh, we've got you know a fellow from India who's looking at how galaxies grow, a fellow from the Congo who is interested in near-Earth asteroids and, and shooting and stars. And shooting stars. Um, a couple of Americans who are doing spectroscopy, a Polish fellow who's a, you know just a whiz at computing, who's doing you know making the data sing and dance. Uh, 
Bob Mackey, an American who built the instrument that NASA is using to measure the properties of the asteroid Bennu samples that were brought back. And it's not that he said, oh, oh, please let me use my instrument. NASA came to him because he's the best at the world at doing this. So we've got lots of world-class science happening. And you can find out about that, but also the whole faith and science question by going to the website, you know, vaticanobservatory.org. I think a, a couple other people to mention would be, um, we have uh, uh, Maria Elena, who is working on dark matter with the Lux Zeppelin ex experiment. She's an adjunct scholar like me. Um, we have, uh, there's th some interesting stuff going on with our website. So we were talking about the exhibit about the Pope's looking through telescopes and he was, and Brother Guy was talking about going there. Well, you can actually go there with, virtually because if you go to vaticanobservatory.va there's a virtual tour of the observatory where you can see this there's also a vaticanobservatory.org that you should check out but the tour is really neat you can walk all through the observatory look at the telescopes look at the exhibits it's quite quite remarkable well and among the remarkable things we've got sacred space astronomy mm -hmm. where we have articles every couple of days written by scholars like my chris me. And the Faith and Science um, Resource Center, which is more than 500 PDFs and articles and videos online, sorted by different topic, edited by Chris. And this allows anyone who's teaching a class in this stuff or just interested for themselves to find materials that will dig into all sorts of different aspects in history and philosophy and theology and the, the big questions of faith and science. And that's at the vaticanobservatory.org site. The, and the two the two websites talk to each other. So if you yeah. just type in Vatican Observatory, you'll probably you'll find us find one place yeah. or the other. Well, guys, listen, I just want to thank you for uh, an incredibly interesting conversation to Brother Guy and Chris. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to the Vatican Observatory for uh, for arranging this. And we wish you a happy eclipse watching and a happy eclipse experiencing. Uh, and once again, we hope you get involved uh, in the work uh, of the Vatican Observatory. So thanks very much. And uh, now back to uh, Chris Kennedy, who will close this out. Thank you very much, uh, Father, Father Jim. It's great to be here and uh, with Brother Guy and Chris Graney. It's, it's a little bit cloudy here in Buffalo, but we're certainly hoping to see a uh, uh, some of the effects that, that that Brother Guy talked about. And either way, it will be it will just be good to be uh, to to be together. I encourage all of the attendees to learn a little bit more about us. Uh, VaticanObservatory.org. We have, as Brother Guy alluded to, we have a, a sacred space membership program. Um, that you can that you can join, get access to some of the additional resources that we uh, that we have on our website and uh, month monthly uh, monthly meetups, uh, so, you know, sort of like this, uh, but a little bit more intimate with um, opportunities for questions and answers with some of the people in, involved in the faith and science community. And uh, we wish everybody um, in the in the eclipse path uh, good weather and clear skies. And if you're not in the eclipse path, we especially thank you for joining us, uh, learning a little bit more about about us and about the uh, the the observatory and the long and rich tradition of the uh, Catholic Church and the Society of Jesus in the in the in science and astronomy. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Guy. Thank you, Chris, and and thank you, uh, Father Martin. And uh, now we're going to go outside. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.